In a previous video, I talked about the importance of templating when it comes to podcasting. Now in this one, I wanna dive deep into my podcasting template that I use every day. Hi, it's Mike from Casefile and Casefile Presents. On this channel, I'm releasing videos on podcasting and audio production. So if you enjoy this kind of content, you can hit subscribe and notification buttons. Okay, so in this video, I wanna do a screencast of my podcast production template. I wanna focus on the track layout and the signal flow. And then in the future videos, we will dive deeper into plugins, compressors, and so on. I keep all of my templates in a folder called templates. And as you can see, I'm currently on version 15. I keep all the older ones as well, just in case I need to revert to, you know, um, and fix something in um, old episodes. But the older ones are all tagged with a gray tag, and the one that I'm currently using is with a green tag. Before we jump into uh, Pro Tools and my session, I want to talk about something, and that's my attitude when it comes to podcast production. See, when it comes to music or movies where I work as an editor, the production process can be exhilarating, can be creative, chaotic, it can take a lot of time um, and money to complete. Podcasting is quite different. So what I found is that it's a mistake to view podcasting and come onto podcast production with the same attitude and with the same sort of um, approach you'd have with creating an album or maybe working a movie. With podcasts, they are quite frequent. So you'll be working on, you know, a weekly show, maybe a bi-weekly show that has the length of a movie. It's an hour long, 90 minutes, something like that. So we are looking at streamlining that production process. But what can you do if you don't want to cut on the quality as well? You know, you've got to compromise. And take a movie production, for example. Each department will work on their own session. So you'll have Foley, you'll have sound design, you've got dialogues, you've got music. And then each mixing engineer will have their own setup as well. Of course, there will be some back and forth going on, but there is that degree of separation between different departments. In podcasting, more than likely you will be doing it all. Well, maybe except music, unless you're composing like myself. What I'm getting at is, like I mentioned before, streamlining the production. And that means having a template that serves you during the editing, mixing and mastering all at the same time. It means that even though I still follow separate production stages, I also kind of work on them at the same time. So they're blended, they're mixed. When I'm editing, I'm mixing. When I'm mastering, I'm editing and so on. Now, what this allows me to do is pretty much from the start, from the day one when I start editing, to hear how the final product, how the final episode will sound. I came up with this kind of workflow by working on case file, which is pretty much a weekly show, and then doing other projects on top of it as well. And that workflow what I found allows me for speed, consistency, and also pretty good quality. But enough talk, let's now jump onto my uh, podcast production template in Pro Tools. Okay, so uh, this is essentially the whole template and it's split into two parts. One is for production, that's editing, mixing, mastering, everything pretty much to do with dialogues and the whole episode. And the second bit of the template is to do with scoring, so music only. Let me hide the scoring part of the template and make this tracks a little bit bigger so we can see what's happening there. At the top, I've got my main track for dialogue. Case file is one narrator show 
that's why I only have one track there. But uh, in case I'm working on a different uh, project or I need more tracks, I just create more. Usually I duplicate that one. Obviously after stripping that for bare EQs and compressors because that's the setups there for case file host. Also, when I import dialogues, I always copy the original, keep it above uh, the track, mute it. And when I edit, I edit them in tandem. So this track and the original, which is muted. And that's why I can always go back to unprocessed dialogues whenever I need. Below we got uh, the, oh, and there is a warning. That's a content warning that we have on every episode and it sits at the same uh, sort of uh, time code uh, for every episode. Below we got uh, the uh, main first sound effects that opens each episode. It's sort of heartbeat with a flat line combined. Then we also got case file theme. Uh, that's theme music, which is after the intro and also at the end of every, every episode. And the time count, the placement for that changes, obviously, depending how long the intro actually is. Uh, two tracks below are for the score for the music, and that's for stereo bounces of the music. One's for my part of the score, and the uh, one below is for Andrew's. So myself and Andrew, we always do the music for these episodes together. Then we got a, a reverb and it's only the dialogue track that goes into the reverb. And it's um, just a tiny bit of a slap reverb, uh, nothing too major. I mean, the send is minus seven and we got like a 30% uh, percent, uh wet of the whole mix and it's like preset is small vocal booth so really nothing outrageous however it lifts the dialogue make it a little bit more present then below we got a stereo mix bus and on the stereo mix bus i got another compressor i got a little bit of eq and then the dialogues the narration as well as the score, as you can see, it goes through that uh, stereo bus, which is one and two input. So as you can see, output on these tracks are um, going through stereo mix bus in order to tighten it all together. So when the dialogue runs with the music, you know, going through the bus, it sort of glues the whole thing together heartbeat and case file theme so the sound effects they don't go through the bus because there's nothing on top of them and they already compressed i don't want to compress them uh, more so as you can see they just go straight to the output these two tracks and then of course i've got my master uh, minus 16 db uh, track everything goes through that track and on that we got Ozone, we got metering plugins, and I also got Sonarworks Reference 4 to uh, hear the flat mix of the whole episode, of the whole podcast. When I work, when I edit, when I mix, when I master, whatever, I work in this setup. And all the plugins from you know the first compressor and EQ to the very last mastering plugin are live. So from the get-go, from the beginning, what I'm hearing is essentially how the final podcast will sound, so to speak, because everything's running at the same time. So there is no, there is a degree of separation, how I work, but the template set up in a way that I hear it the correct loudness, the dialogues, the music, everything to the correct loudness all the time and with correct EQs, correct compressors. Okay, let's move on. Okay, let's now hide these 
And let's have a look at my scoring. So when I score, when I write music, I'm in this layout, which is set up to um, easily create music. We start with Omnisphere and it sits there. So that's my Omnisphere and inside of it I got Keyscape, Omnisphere, Trillian and bunch of libraries that I use. Now that sits on, on the first auxiliary and there's also several other auxiliaries created underneath. I don't typically use them because I tend to create one element of the music at the time. However, for some projects, I use the uh, multi uh, and live feature sometimes. But for case file, most of the time I hide them. So I, I only have the first auxiliary there uh, visible. But is there when I need it? The first four MIDI tracks are for Omnisphere. So it's there. If I need more, I create more. But usually my music consists of three, maybe four elements. So we got bass, we got the middle and we got melodies. That's, that's pretty much it. And bass becomes the rhythm track as well. Okay, moving on. Um, another auxiliary, that's for Stylus RMX. And it's again from Spectrasonic, it's a groove uh, module. So that's for rhythms that I use from time to time. Not as much for case file, but definitely for other projects. And I got four uh, tracks created for that as well, for the Stylus. Okay, and then these are stems. So when I create a MIDI track, what I do is I commit the track. So let's just commit. And what it does, it if I have a, a module there selected, let's say Dark and Moody String Orchestra, and then I commit whatever I've written in a MIDI to it, it automatically creates Okay, I can't do it. But anyway, it automatically creates an audio track underneath. And that's where I place it on my stems. So stems, there is no input. They go straight to output. And essentially, there are just layers of what I've just created as audio tracks, so not MIDI. And I keep them there. I keep them there. They're not mixed. Nothing's happening. It's just the layers of the queue that I make. And each cue I then remix in three or four different styles. So there is that degree of variation with each cue, and I don't need to create as much music, um, as much, you know, as many cues I, as I would have to for each episode. Okay, moving on. I have another track that doesn't do anything, it's just there to indicate what's below. So we got Omnisphere and we got Spitfire. As you can see, I've got click underneath each of them. So if I'm using Omnisphere, I will hide that and then, you know, vice versa. If I'm using Spitfire, then I would use uh, the, um, I would hide the Omnisphere on top, which, you know, we can do now. And we're left with just Spitfire. No, I forgot to hide these two. Okay, and the MIDI Omni as well. Okay, so that's just for Spitfire. And essentially, it's the same layout. So we got a click, and then I got auxiliary with contact, and that's um, I got all beyond one, and that's for uh, brass, strings, and woods. So very simple uh, virtual instrument for orchestration. I don't do much orchestration, but for some projects, like the last one I was working on, um, I used, used it quite a lot. And again, we got MIDI tracks, eight of them, and stems, where I place the audio tracks after I commit um, the MIDI. Now, that's 
for creation of the score of music. How I actually score the episode is I go back to the initial layout and remember I had it all inactive when I was making music, especially the master, because I don't want the virtual instrument going through the master track because that will induce quite a bit of delay, especially if you're playing on your MIDI controller. But now we've got our stems and I will have them visible there. So imagine I've got a bunch of tracks, cues there. I make this active again, but now I've got these 12 tracks there. And what I do is if I have the episode, I'll select the cue and for example here there is, there is an intro and we got three minutes of music, I've got a cue there and we'll go in depth how I actually do it with the tracks in the future videos. What I do is I then drop them on the instrument tracks and the instrument tracks will be mixed to the dialogue. So I will mix it my, on my mixing controller, uh, Avid S1, um, each track the, with the volume automation on. As you can see, all of it's on large. So I'm writing automation and I also uh, have a mixing plugins there. After it's all mixed, I will then bounce it as stereo and place it on the score stereo track. So the layers are mixed to the narration, bounced to the narration, and, um, and then I mix them again, the stereo bounce to the narration tracks. What um, is important is that when I mix them here, so when I mix the separate stems, I have the uh, master track on because I want to hear how everything sounds together. You know, I want to hear it within the context of, of the episode. But when I bounce it, of course, I don't want to have the master track on. So I make it inactive. I then solo the layers, bounce them, and then I place them there because I don't want to bounce them fully master because then when we go to into mixing stage they will go through the master again so mastering during the first mix is only to hear it in a context okay that's the whole sort of template that's the signal flow that i always follow in the future videos, I will go into um, each of these elements, sort of explain it a little bit better with examples. Hopefully that wasn't uh, too complicated and I've explained it clearly to you. As you can see, I still follow the standard production stages. However, they are very fluid. I mix and I blend all the time. When I'm editing, I'm mixing. When I'm mixing, I'm mastering. When I'm mastering, I'm still editing. And that allows me for consistency, for speed, and to uphold the quality in the long term. So that was a short overview of my podcast production template. The template allows me to control every aspect of the sound of the session, and at the same time, from the beginning, I can hear, and at least I have an idea, how the final master will sound. I use the same template for all my podcasting projects, but of course, you know, this one is made for case file. So for non-case file uh, podcasts, I keep the same template, but I strip it back to just uh, sort of fundamental EQs and compressors but I leave the track layout and the signal flow. That's it for today. I'm Mike Migis. If you want to learn more about podcasting and audio production, you can check the rest of my channel as well as my website, mikemigas.com. For now, you can share, you can like or subscribe, and I'll see you later.